FYI, recording is in progress. Um, <laughs> welcome to our History of the LGBTQ Plus Movement at UMB panel. I'm Madeline, I use she, her pronouns, and I am the president of the Lambda Pride Alumni Group. Um, super, super grateful to be here with all of you today, uh, including not only some folks from my amazing um, Lambda Pride board, but also some very distinguished panelists. So we're gonna get an opportunity to learn about sort of where we've been, where we are, and where we have the opportunity to go um, through a, what I hope is a semi-interactive discussion. Um, it's a relatively small crowd here. So we are all about making this a back and forth conversation. Um, but before we dive into the Q&A of the panel, Luke has graciously offered to provide us an overview of sort of the queer movement at UMD from their perspective. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Luke. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, as Madeline said, I'm Luke Jensen. I use he and they pronouns, and I was the director of the LGBT Equity Center for a very long time. So um, the history of LGBTQ plus people at Maryland has been something is something that has been on my mind uh, in previous times. And so I like to sort of do some thematic things that might be helpful to guide the uh, discussion or might not be helpful, whatever uh, uh, it works. But, you know, I can't be on a conversation or on a panel without having at least a little bit of a, of a PowerPoint. So here we go. Um, let's see. Start show. <laughs> so you're seeing that, right? So LGBTQ plus people at UMD, just an overview by, uh, by me. So this is divided into major themes in consideration of LGBTQ plus people at Maryland. And I start with the Lavender Scare of the 1950s and 1960s. And as some of you will already know, the Lavender Scare, um, actually the roots of the Lavender Scare go earlier than the Red Scare, but they very much uh, amplified uh, one another. And whereas the, the Red Scare started to die down around 1956, the Lavender Scare went way into the 1960s. And it's the, the important um, bit to keep in mind is the Johns Committee in the state of Florida. They actively went out to try and find LGBTQ plus people, of course, they didn't call them that, um, and, and uh, would intimidate people to give up other names. And so this was, this was done in um, the various public universities in the state of Florida. Now, whereas I don't have any evidence that anything, on, certainly not on that scale, happened at Maryland, I think that it's important to sort of keep in mind that that's the, that's the climate that we were coming out of. Um, and so the Lavender Scare of the 1950s, actually there is some stuff about what it was happening at Maryland before then, but it was uh, uh, fairly minor. It had to do with law enforcement and shutting down bathrooms where gay men were tapping their feet. So there you go. Uh, the next, there we go, uh, Frank Kameny, the Student Homophile Association and Bovello v. Kaplan. Frank Kameny pl actually plays a part because people like Dirk Backer in the 1960s were working and organizing with, with Frank and um, they were also students at the University of Maryland and under some, some of his influence anyway was getting there and of course Frank Kameny uh, was a very well-known activist uh, and very much associated with the Mattachine Society. And <clears throat> so in working with Dirk Backer and some other folks from the University of Maryland, uh, they ins it inspired them to form the Student Homophile Association at Maryland. There is some disagreement as to when it actually started. 1969 has been mentioned by some, uh, but officially it wasn't uh, an official a student group that was asking for money until 1971. The uh, uh, Board of Regents tried to take the money away. They actually went into federal court and sued, and the students won. They were represented by the ACLU, and they were they they won on the basis of free speech, the First Amendment, which is kind of interesting and comes up actually a little bit later. And in fact, it does come up 
when we're talking about sexual orientation and UMD's non-discrimination policy. The earliest uh, conversations that I found with the non-discrimination policy from around 1971 is in the context of the Human Relations Code. The Human Relations Code started to be discussed in 71, and there was, at that time, the phrase sexual preference as part of the protected classes. Well, I've read so many notes from the, from the uh, uh, various Senate committees, and uh, that, that phrase was dropped. And right after that, at the same time that was dropped, what was inserted was the phrase rights secured by the First Amendment of the Constitution, which is basically lifted right out of the Bovello and Kaplan lawsuit. Um, the students at that time, I think it's important to note that they, they weren't having it. They wanted sexual orientation in there and they did lobby and press for that. But it wasn't until 1992 that we actually had it in the uh, non-discrimination non policy. Um, actually, I, I, I wanna mention, I know I get on sidetracks, I'll try not to too much. Um, the the uh, human relations, uh, the office of, oh, help me, Mark, the office of, uh, you know, the office that you used to be in. Office of uh, human anyway. relations programs that became the office of diversity equity. <laughs> There you go. The Office of Human Relations Programs. So that was actually founded, I believe it was 1972. They didn't have a non-discrimination policy until 1976. So they were they had an office, but no policy to enforce. Anyway, so it didn't. So and, and what happened? And there's all sorts of intricate details that I won't bore you with right now. But what happened is that the university was not allowed to have sexual orientation until either the state or unless there was in the federal state or local law, the uh, Prince George's County added sexual orientation to their non-discrimination policies in 1991. And then the following year, it was added to the University of Maryland. So so as, as Prince George's County goes, so goes the University of Maryland. That's a little sarcasm there anyway. Um, all right, so that's when it went in, and that's not actually, I clicked twice, there you go. Um, I put gender identity expression in UMD's non-discrimination policy usually here because I think it's important to pair with the uh, uh, sexual orientation non-discrimination policy, but it doesn't really fit chronologically. As far as I know, the first uh, efforts to put in gender identity expression was in 2001 when uh, a group of us put it into the uh, Senate and the Senate took it up and we went through all sorts of per uh, things that really didn't help in the long run until the state of Maryland put it into state law. And once it went into state law, then we added it into our non-discrimination policy at the University of Maryland in 2014. So the move for equal pay for equal work domestic partner benefits started in 1992. We actually got the domestic partner benefits in 2009. Uh, and that's when this, again, that's when the state provided them to all state employees. 1992, it grew out of the push for, or the addition of sexual orientation to the non-discrimination policy. And there was a group of folks um, that I became involved with. Anyway, there's a group of folks who um, said, how do we make this non-discrimination policy real? How do we make it something that is really going to be impactful? And um, lots of stuff, lots of drama, including protests and uh, uh, all that good stuff. So finally in 1998, uh, we went, uh, we had established the position of coordinator for LGBT equity. And I was asked to serve that in that as a, as a interim. And then later there was a search and I was selected to be the coordinator. And shortly thereafter, I, I, I approached Cordell Black. And I said, you know, there's a little bit of disparate treatment here. You know, all your other direct reports are directors and I'm a coordinator. What's up with that? And he said, you're absolutely right. We'll make you the director of the Office of LGBT Equity. And of course, I had an office of one. So there you go. Um, but we grew over the years and uh, added various people uh, and staffing and moved from a horrible location, which was 
in a building that's changed names. I think it's the Atlantic building or something like that now. Um, it used to be um, computer and space sciences. Um, and of course, all the computers and space scientists moved out of that building and went someplace else. Anyway, uh, so there's that. And then the final group, uh, LGBT study, oh, not the final, the next to the final, LGBT studies at Maryland. And that uh, was official in 2002. Of course, it has since, it was standalone initially, but it has since merged with the department, which used to be the Department of Women's Studies, but now is the Harriet Tubman Department of Women gender and sexuality studies. These things that happened in later years, I have to stop and think for a minute. <laughs> and then finally we have, whoa, what did I do that? Oh dear. So in 2012, UMD was named among the best of the best of LGBTQ friendly campuses. And that's been something that we've had from 2012 to the present day. Um, and there's interesting things to say about that and the future of that designation. But in any case, I think that's a very broad overview. I could go into any one of those in greater detail if you want, but I don't wanna take up an hour and a half. So let me uh, let me turn it back and we will open up the panel, I guess, or whatever it is that's next. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, I'm delighted to welcome all of you here. My name is Mark from Hall Vargas. I use he and L pronouns and I am your moderator for tonight. One of the things I'd like to do is make it very okay for people to also interject with questions and comments um, in the chat. If you would like to also speak, um, let me know. But we'd like to introduce our panelists and get the ball rolling. So I'm wondering uh, to the panelists. Uh, so the panelists are uh, Luke Jensen and Joey DeSanto Jones and Ed Chang and Madeline Moore. Um, I would like to invite each of them to introduce themselves, uh, pronouns if you wish, and uh, your connection to UMD and the LGBTQ plus community here. Why don't we start? I realize Zoom offers this. Um, let's do it in the sort of order that I see it. If we could do Luke, Madeline, uh, Joey, and Ed. I think you already met me, Luke Jensen, they and he pronouns, and I was the director of the, what is now the LGBTQ plus Equity Center at the University of Maryland until last May. Hey everyone, I introduced myself before uh, very briefly, Madeline, she, her pronouns, and in addition to being the Lambda Pride president, um, I am also someone who both went to school at University of Maryland and now works there. I'm on campus right now. Um, I work at the University Health Center where my primary focus is substance use education, harm reduction and prevention, which we know is hugely important in the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and I also serve on our Student Affairs Diversity Initiative committee, um, which is a relatively new designation and a very, very exciting one. And I'm one of the one of the few queer voices on that on that um, panel. So I feel very, very privileged and honored to be there. And I mean, for better or worse, Maryland is me, you know, I would, I it, it's where I found my queer identity. It's where I began to understand myself as a queer person and an activist and a uh, public health professional as a queer person. Um, and clearly I like it enough that I'm still here. So I'm super excited to be here with all of you and dive into some of these questions. Thank you. Next. So, sorry, Mark. Joey, go ahead. Sorry about to cut you off there. Uh, my name is Joey DeSanto Jones. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I'm an alum. And it's fun to say that because I've lots of lots of one of these little folks have worn lots of titles and hats over the years. My current role is alum. Um, some of the roles that I have had has been student. I'm a two time terp. Uh, I graduated with my undergraduate degree in 2002. Um, I arrived in 98. So enjoyed Luke's presentation because when he was coordinator, I just showed up to some 18 year old kids and I'm like, oh, they have all this stuff, not knowing all of the work that went in to get that little coordinator title in comparison to those other titles, which were a little bit higher than coordinator. They were director, as Dr. Jensen mentioned. Uh, but fell in love with Maryland, um, similar to Madeline, uh, really came into my own um, identity and identities over the course of my undergraduate, graduate, and first 
job. Um, I did my graduate work at College Student Personnel, which was the name of the program at the time, graduating in 06. And my very first job um, was in the Department of Transportation Services, which I believe is still within the Division of Student Affairs. And at the time, I was like, what is this? Why is this in Student Affairs? So I'm very grateful. Um, for that initial um, opportunity, because it definitely showed me that learning and development can happen in lots of different places um, and spaces as well. So I've done that. Um, I'm married to a wonderful man who's been working at the university longer than I was there. So Luke, as you were talking about benefits, I am a, I benefit from those benefits because I'm like, that's my health insurance. So uh, thank you, State of Maryland. Um, and at one point, um, I was also the Lambda Pride president prior to Madeline taking on the reins. So kudos to Madeline um, for her role. So love Maryland, happy to be here. And I think, Ed, I think you're up next, right? Hello. Well, I am not at Maryland anymore. <laughs> um, uh, uh, my name is uh, Ed Chang. Uh, I am currently an assistant professor of English at Ohio University, which is where I am uh, telecommuting from. Um, but I was, I'm an, a two-time alum also. I uh, finished, I did my undergrad degree, finished in 93. Um, and then uh, started grad school, didn't finish grad school, then started grad school again, and so finished my master's in 2005. Um, and so there has been sort of very strange moments of overlap with, especially with Luke and, and I think probably some other people. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's who I am. I'm, I can talk about all sorts of things. I'm now trying to like, been trying to comb my memory because this was so long ago about like you know what we did and, and stuff like that so uh, I did want to point out that um this the image behind me is the national coming out day ads that I don't know if they I'm assuming they still run uh in the Diamondback no oh that's so sad um but uh they used to we used to run ads where people signed up to you know be out and to name you know name themselves as either uh, out uh, students or grad students or faculty or staff and then the other side would be um, allies and uh, we would you know people would try to scrape we had to scrape together money to pay for them because the Diamondback wouldn't give them to us for free and like you know all that sort of stuff but uh, so this these are the ads this is the ad from 1997 uh, which I designed so um, I just put a little bit of history uh, up there. <clears throat> Thank you all. I I wonder if in, in the spirit of sort of exploring history for thinking also about the future, um, I'd like to ask this question um, of each of you and then perhaps some, some uh, thoughts or comments from, from people who are here in the chat or something like that. I'd like to ask you, what do you think is possible today because of all the work that was done before? So it, it's very important to recognize the work that was done before, but similar to what Joey has brought forward, like I have health insurance today because of all the work that happened before. I, I'm wondering if, if the four of you could help connect the past with the present and the past with the future uh, about where we are and where we might be going based on the work that has been done now. And whoever wants to start that conversation. starting off with the easy ones, right? <laughs> um, I'll kick us off. Um, I, I think I am potentially the baby on this panel. Um, I graduated in 2015. Um, so yep, baby here, which means that I have benefited from all of the work that all you did, right? Like there's a reason that I am here in this moment and it's due in large part because of the work that you all contributed to this campus. Um, so I have benefited directly from Luke's work, from, you know, from Joey's work, from Ed's work, from Mark's work, all of it together, because one of the things that I think is so critical and makes the University of Maryland such a successful place to be a queer student is there really is this sense of community. Um, and that's something that, spoiler alert, we're going to chat about in some other questions. But I think that the sense of queer community has become, and I, I use the word queer because the acronym is a lot for my list sometimes. <laughs> um, but I hope that's not super offensive to others. Um, so anyway, um, 
I think there was a lot of work to build community, to build presence, to build visibility, certainly with the National Coming Out Day, um, what's it called, flyers um, in the Diamondback. I mean, I remember being a new faculty member and signing up to be an out faculty member at UMD, and that was really exciting to me um, as someone who was told I'd have to be closeted my whole life in order to have a career, right? I mean, even someone who graduated in 2015 was getting those messages. Where I think we have the opportunity to, and, and are starting to in a meaningful way, um, and I think Shige, who's in the audience, is really uh, championing a lot of this in this moment, is focusing on that intersectionality piece, is focusing on the like celebrating the full scope of queer community on this campus um, and not relating just based on what we have in common potentially, but also celebrating all the things that make our own unique stories so special and, and better understanding and trying to, to learn from each other's respective lenses. I think that's something that we are beginning to approach meaningfully at the community level. And I think it's something that we still, there's a lot of lip service at the administrative level, but I think we still have a lot of work to do uh, to see some meaningful shifts related to true intersectionality at the university. And I think that's one of my top priorities as someone who is a staff member here in this moment, and certainly being in a healthcare facility. Um, so that's something I think about quite, quite often as a queer woman, but also like, a white, able-bodied, you know, U.S. citizen woman who speaks English as my first language. Thank you, Madeline. Others thoughts about past, present, future? Yeah, let me echo what what Madeline was saying about intersectionality. I do think that that's really important, and you know, that's something that that was on my mind for a very long time, and. There were years where we did okay, and then there were years where we did do okay, and uh, and so there was there was always that. Uh, I mean, one story that I, I usually have a story uh, was back in the late 1990s. There was talk of the, the main thing that, and Ed will know this. The main thing that the Pride Alliance did was Safe Space, and at that time, Safe Space was a weekly meeting, and Ed led so many of them, and and they they followed a format where you go around the room and they would have a topic to discuss if nothing else came up, but um, that would all come to a stop if there was someone who really needed to check in and talk a little bit more. And there was talk at a certain point in the late 1990s of there being a people of color safe space. And I didn't have any authority there, so I didn't want to say anything during the meeting, but I actually went to the meeting of the leadership of the Pride Alliance. And just as you could possibly foretell, every white student in the room said, oh no, we're gonna divide us. Every person of color says, don't worry, we'll still come. We just need a space for us. So it was like, okay. So, you know, one of the things I did is I pulled, uh, you know, one of the, the student leaders, one of those white student leaders uh, aside and he said, you don't, if somebody tells you that they need something, believe them. They're not going to lie about it. You know, they need this. And so help them. And, and, and then I pulled one of the students of color aside and I said, you don't need the permission of the white kids in order to do this. If you want support uh, to help organize this, you know, I'm here and, let, and I will support you every step of the way. So I, I think that there is still some kind of dynamic along those lines because there are good years and there are less good years. And I think in going forward, I think the biggest issue, one of the issues is let's not backslide. And I think given our, the current political climate, that would be, that would be easy to do. So, um, so I think re-examining, keeping certain things alive, constant attention to things that need to happen but this just aren't uh, are things going forward and of course I, I think we're now doing again thanks in part to, to Shige is that we're doing a lot more around trans and non-binary identities than what we've done the, and that needs to continue as well as asexuality uh, so there you go Great. others Joey Ed, thoughts and you've been commenting in the, the chat. Do you want to go or should I hop in? Um, sure. I mean, I, I don't have a, 
I mean, I don't know. I always say I don't have a lot to say, and then I have a lot to say. Um, I, I think for me, mostly, it was, I think I want to echo Madeline's sort of community bit and and really sort of say, you know, I grew up in Maryland. I went to high school in Maryland, and Maryland was the only school I applied to for college. Uh, my parents don't know that. Um, <laughs> And uh, and I didn't come out actually until I was a grad student, and so um, it was in in the '90s, and I was like, it was it was really scary, but also really a great place to see that there were already pieces established. So it wasn't like I mean, you know, I teach at Ohio University, and we have a really great uh, queer center, but it is so much more isolating for our students here because we are a rural Southern Ohio, you know, university. And so it's a very different feel. And then add on to that, if you're of color or if you're trans or if you're, you know, have a disability, like it just, you know, magnifies all of that. So I really appreciated the community. It was my first taste of organizing and activism. Um, I remember there was a couple of years where I think I was in the paper almost every week. Like it just was kind of crazy. Um, and then obviously, I, you know, I got the, my first chops as a scholar there. And so, you know, I did English. Um, and then my master's was in like queerness and digital spaces. And then I went on to do my PhD. Um, and now, you know, my current work is on um, on queer game studies and uh, and games of color and spectacle of literature of color. And so these are all things that sort of grew out of my time uh, at uh, Maryland. Um, I will say just to note one thing, like, Maryland is the only place where I, it was my first, also my first taste of therapy uh, through the counseling center. And it's the only place thus far I have been to and found readily accessible, like a queer uh, uh, counseling group or even a queer of color counseling group. And so I just wanted to just, I hope that still exists and it's still going on, but it was uh, really great. I appreciate the comments um, from my, my fellow Terps here as well, too. And I don't think I have anything new to add to it. It's just, I mean, all of what you said resonates. And I think in terms of, you know, add the paper behind you, you know, from when I logged in, it, to me, it's visibility. And Luke hearing, you know, that timeline, which to some of us graduated in 2015 or 2002, you look in the 50s, 60s, that's not that long ago, right? Like that, that is not that long ago. And the fight and the struggle just for very basic visibility, um, Ted, I think it's a great question. I didn't know, like, do we still do the outlist? Because I remember being like dicey, am I going to put my name in it? Not like, what is it going to mean? Everybody knew anyway. But like, but, but it was hard for 19-year-old me, right? Or 22-year-old me. Um, and that's 22-year-old me as a white cisgender guy who came from a pretty privileged background and didn't know it. Um, so I think in terms of that fight for visibility and Luke, I'm thinking back to the era of late nineties and I probably was one of those students, unfortunately, it's like, wait, this is for everybody. Yeah. Cause everybody looked like me. Right. Um, in the group and in the space at that time. And it's, I, I think it's great. Madeline, I appreciate you opening up, opening up the door for the first question to talk about intersectionality. Cause I don't think those conversations were happening to the same degree. If they were, I wasn't in them or I didn't get them. Um, just because of where I was. Um, and I probably still don't fully get them um, as a work in progress. But I think it's great that we're at that point to have that conversation and to push, um, but not to be Pollyannish about it. Luke, I also agree with your comments too about the current political environment. It could be so easy to backslide into that as well too. So no, I, I appreciate the comments of my colleagues and friends here. I agree. So add, especially about, if, if you don't mind, Mark. Yeah. No, please. Um, uh, add about the, the, the outlets, uh, we stopped doing it because it became prohibitively expensive and it was just ridiculous. Um, there were so many, so many things that that was useful for and to hear Joey talk about it, one of the things that it served was it became kind of a, a milestone in some people's development. It was sort of like, yes, I know I'm gay and all these things. I, maybe I've even told my parents, but am I ready to actually put my name on the out list? And, and they would, and, they, and there was just this real feeling of pride. Uh, now, there was other things that was useful to it. I also, I also think that the utility of it isn't as strong or wasn't as strong when we stopped doing it as it had been earlier on. Uh, but, um, but like I said, it was a tool. And that sort of shows you too uh, uh, that 
things evolve over time and the programs that we establish or that we have today might not be as useful in the future. And I recognize that. And that's why it was a good time for me to retire. So that some younger other people could, could think and rethink uh, how we do this work and what is actually needed at the time. I do want to add though, that I think like uh, now that I've been in higher ed for so long and at, at one, two, three, four institutions now, and like sometimes I like that we're doing pro that you're doing a program like this, and I feel like we should do that all like every year or at least every couple of years in where wherever you are, because I feel like I you know some of some of being young is to do the things the way you want to do them, but then there's always this like reinventing the wheel like every single time a new cohort comes through, and so some of that like maybe that makes me I'm old now, so I'm just like remember your history <laughs> um, <laughs> when I was young. <laughs> you know, like so, but I just I really appreciate this. So uh, I want to thank Shige for that amazing question because one of the things that often happens when we think about history is often a history of struggle, uh, but we forget that sometimes there's a lot of joy in our history and joy in our present because of the joy in our history. Um, and so I want to uh, Shige, if you would like to read your question, um, I'm, ha I'm please come off mute and do that, or I could do it for you. Sure, I'm happy to read. I think I'm staying off camera tonight, but um, I was just curious uh, to hear more about what are some moments of joy, empowerment, achievement, um, particularly in LGBTQ plus community or identity that really were important to you or shaped your experiences at UMD. And, and that may also be additionally, what did you find most difficult in your, your own personal experiences at UMD? Not just for the movement, but but for you. Whoever would like to take that great question. So I was a student leader in the, the formal leadership role sense, which probably inflated my ego at the time. God help me and God help you, Luke, for working with me at that time. And many years after, and many other people in this group. Um, but I remember uh, one of my mentors and friends and still mentors, uh, Dr. Marshall Ginsler Stevens, who's the director of the Stamp Union, did this program when I was like a junior or a senior, and it was called like God and Gaze. And it was, it's like a, a multi-faith panel um, from different religious and spiritual practices. I, remember, I clearly remember going to bed night for being terrified. Like someone's gonna come up and protest my event. I'm like, what are they gonna do? But like someone's gonna come and like protest my event. And to this day, Marsha, who I had lunch with probably this summer at Bus Boys in Hyattsville, she still talks about this program. And I remember at the time, she's like, this is such a great program. And in my brain at the time, I think I was very much like, a successful program is lots of butts and seats. Lots of people have to come. You can get a lot of people in a place, they don't learn anything or don't get changed by anything, right? Or it can be a great program with hundreds of thousands of people. This is a small program, um, but to her, like high substance and high quality and someone who at a very young age is a traditional age undergraduate student, um, put a lot of faith in me as a leader running it. She facilitated this panel, uh, but I just remember that affirmation from someone the night before being so nervous about that. And it wasn't a big program, but it was a high quality substance program. Um, and in the grand scheme of all the stuff that the wonderful people in this group have done, it's probably a drop in the bucket, but I think we all have lots of drops in that very, very large bucket. Um, but to me, I still remember that. And that's 20 plus years ago. Um, and that the words of affirmation from a mentor um, to me mean something. And the fact that it still comes up, that she'll bring it up. I, I very much generally appreciate that. Others? I would say every year at Lavender graduation. Um, there were times when I, you know, I was reduced to tears because I, it was so moving. And there are certain individuals who spoke at the mic who uh, who really said things that that were quite moving and, and important for for they were important for me to hear because it was like, no, you're not yelling into the wind. It's actually, you're getting some traction here. And, uh, you know, those of anyone who is doing this work as their profession knows that there are moments when it can be extremely lonely and you can feel extremely isolated. And at Lavender graduation, and then later on at, at Qualcomm, to see this mass of people 
um, uh, for Qualcomm who are coming in and want to be involved. And then with Lavender Graduation, all of these success stories uh, and the things that people overcame, those were, those were really good times. I just typed in the chat, Qualcomm is still one of my favorite events of the year to work, um, you know, as an employee. I love, 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 love being in that space. And um, when you asked that question, Mark, a um, couple, couple things came to mind, as I'm sure they did for all of us. Um, the first thing that came to my mind was actually the first time I ever stepped foot on this campus. I think I'm the one person who was ever born in Maryland who didn't come here until I was applying for schools. Um, and not gonna lie, I wanted to go away. Um, and University of Maryland was dead last on my list. I did not want to stay here. I was not about it. But I saw it was April, and I saw a big fat rainbow flag um, in front of the Stamp Student Union. And seeing that, and having that visual affirmation of you will not have to hide here was so affirming and you know I was there like with my dad and who I had like a weird relationship with and I was like he can't know how how into this I am but I'm like very like this is my school now that I think of that day as the day I started being a University of Maryland community member um and then the second thing that comes to mind pretty immediately was less one event and more of sort of a through line of my journey here, which started at orientation, where I think a, a well-intentioned but um, misguided, a slightly older student who was clearly visibly um, like butch lesbian. Uh, I, I went to her because the bat signal was there and I was like, you probably know it. You probably know how to get involved here in ways that I'm trying to get involved. So I went up to speak to her and just introduce myself. I came from a really small school, really small high school. So I was used to just like going up to people and not being intimidated. And the first thing that she said to me was, I see you have a lot of enthusiasm, but you're gonna wanna change your look because you can't be feminine and be a leader here. And I remember that becoming my kind of like mission to prove her wrong because I cannot remember the last time I wore pants. Like I'm just like, look up the definition of them in the dictionary and I am right there, um, which is difficult sometimes as, as a, a queer woman, a lesbian woman. And to go from that place of this like dark night of the soul of like, do I have to change everything about how I understand myself in order to be visible in this community here that literally brought me to this campus that was last on my list? Did I make a huge mistake? Am I wrong? Am I bad? to then, you know, sort of climbing up the, the queer ladder for student involvement and eventually becoming Pride Alliance president and the MICA LGBTQ plus intern and working so closely with the LGBT Equity Center and actually getting sent to the Creating Change Conference on the Equity Center's behalf. Um, and now being the Lambda Pride president and on the Sadie Committee, like I, the fact that I successfully proved that person wrong brings me a lot of joy. And I also hope that this person in their own life was able to expand their understanding of what a leader in this community can and should look like. So it was a really important lesson for me. I'm just gonna add just really quickly, I think I have a couple of like distinct memories. Um, you know, at the time uh, that I was out, I was a grad student and I was, um, you know, pretty out and loud and rainbow everything and like all that sort of stuff. And um, it was really important to me. I taught only, I only taught freshman comp. And so, you know, not necessarily, um, uh, 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 you know, like the most interesting course ever. And in fact, a course that often students resent because it is a requirement. But I realized that um, that was the first inkling where I was like, oh, it's I'm, it's great to get, you know, first years because then you can set the stage for, you know, the rest of their lives, kind of what you were talking about, Madeline. And, um, and uh, I just remember just, you know, I was probably the first out queer person that they've ever met um, or... I would have students that would, you know, send me an email or come up to me and be like, you know, you know, 
out themselves to me because now suddenly they have had someone that they could talk to. And that has, you know, that kind of experience has followed me obviously throughout my career because it, it's just one of those things that I think, you know, being a visible community member and being a visible faculty member, I think is really powerful. And then the only other, the not the only other memory, but the other memory is, um, is both good and bad kind of to get to the Shiga question um, is that, you know, I really enjoyed the time when we had to come together because something horrible was in the Diamondback or, um, or I remember very distinctly um, when Matthew Shepard died in 98, like, you know, there was a whole series of things that, that everyone really sort of like rallied the, you know, troops for. And I, I, uh, that was just, you know, it was just really amazing to, to sort of see and think about. And I can obviously see that replicated through all of the various uh, tragedies and problems and things like that over the decades. Uh, I'm actually wondering, Shige, if it would be okay. I, I wanna step out of facilitator role and actually answer your question also because of how incredibly profound it is. Um, I, I arrived at the University of Maryland in 1997, and it was in a it was in a soft money here today gone tomorrow position, and in what was then the Office of Human Relations Programs. I remember being very out in the entire experience. I was always out in the process of being hired. I was always out when I was there, and I received um, from the director at that time advice that was, I believe, intended to be very well-meaning. It really was. Um, but it was advice that essentially said that at Maryland, I would not be successful if I continued to be out. And I would not be successful if I continued to participate in the activities that advanced LGBT equity and visibility. And what was interesting to me about that, even in 1997, was exactly what Ed is pointing to. Despite that advice, there was a very visible active community and I it, and it was incongruous. I, I was like, how is this possible that I'm getting this advice? And yet everything around me indicates a very vibrant community in which that was my experience that it was a very vibrant community. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work at two other universities at Tufts and at Brandeis. And um, I have to say that it is my opinion that the LGBTQ community in Maryland is unique. It has depth in a way that I really have not experienced at these other two universities that frankly, I kind of miss. I miss what was possible, the, the sort of everyday interactions, but also the overt uh, organizational programming, uh, the, the administration stuff, like all of it that really felt like it was a well-rounded community academically, socially, professionally, and, and in terms of uh, life. So, so I'm really grateful to Marilyn for that because I was grateful for the well-meaning advice because it indicated somebody cared about my safety. I was also really grateful that the community was so robust that it was actually not necessary. So anyway, to answer that great question, Shige. Um, let me ask a, a different question. So based on uh, the work that is ongoing, what remains to be done? What, it, what is the next hurdle uh, at Maryland uh, and how perhaps might alumni or students come together to support those endeavors? What are your thoughts about what our next journey looks like? Oh, come on, Madeline. I know you are. I know. I'm well, always before Kriti, who don't want to talk first? Do it, Madeline. Do it. <laughs> Do it. Do it. I am so bad at silence. Um, but um, I don't think there's one thing. Um, I think there are a lot of things that are in kind of the beginning stages that I'm excited to see advance. Um, I forget who mentioned it before, but all the work that is currently being done to uplift and elevate the trans and non-binary communities um, at the university, I, I'm really excited for that work to be elevated and institutionalized in ways that 
it's possible I haven't even dreamed of yet, right? Um, speaking from the health perspective and the, and the wellness perspective, um, I do not believe that there is health equity between LGBTQ plus students and their cisgender slash heterosexual peers. Um, I work in behavioral health, um, not as a clinician, but as an educator and public health professional. And I, and part of that means that because I don't wear that clinician hat, students talk to me differently. Also because I'm visibly and audibly out on campus, students talk to me differently. And I often see students who, or get connected with students who are experiencing addiction, whose friends are experiencing addiction, or just other harmful substance use behaviors. And we know that LGBTQ plus communities experience incredibly disproportionate substance use rates, and there are different reasons for engaging in them. Talk about minority stress, right? Com take that identity, and I'm sure compounding more and more and more identities on top of it, just like all of us, none of us are just one thing. But I don't know that there has been capacity built yet to really examine what we can do to uplift and elevate student well-being um, for specifically LGBTQ plus students, because we know that the needs are different. We know that the community is different than the general student population. And quite frankly, the vast majority of um, the resources that are directed in my field are directed at uh, Greek life and residence life, um, predominantly Greek life and a little bit of athletics. Um, they are seen as kind of the higher rate drinkers because they have higher populations of students. Um, I'm seeing she gave out something in the chat. We're revitalizing the president's commission on LGBTQ plus issues, using it to look at several key areas, likely including specific, I'm reading for those who watch it back in recording, focal points around race and intersectionality, health, wellness, student development, broad climate and needs assessment and trans policy, particularly IT and data issues and restrooms and facilities issues. So yeah, that, again, a great example of work that is starting to be done, right? So I'm really excited to see what this next chapter holds, but I do think that uh, an increased focus on student well-being and um, trans and non-binary um, respect and concern and care on this campus, those are kind of the two things that I see as the most critical in this moment, especially coming off of um, the COVID-19 pandemic and moving into the endemic. Uh, though, though the other panelists are not necessarily at Maryland, I certainly would like to hear your thoughts about our future journey, perhaps at Maryland or broader, you know, where do we go next as a community? You know, Mark, something that's on my mind, um, and I appreciate she gave the list you have there of really critical issues. So I, I worry that there was so much momentum around marriage equality in particular as a topic. Um, for those who choose or want to get married, that's wonderful. And I say that as someone who chose and got married. Um, I also think for some, maybe a lot of us, there was like, all right, hit the top of the mountain, check visibility, we reach the social norm, we can chill and relax now. And so that big list that she gave, we're not even touching that yet in a lot of cases. There are folks who are doing this work day to day, um, but looking at policy changes, you know, student basic needs as well. You know, there's, there's a lot of topics beyond that. And so I worry that, you know, we've done such work around visibility, which is great. I can backtrack, but also we, we kind of hit this for some, a mile marker. And then it became almost a, all right, I'm tapping out. Um, I've done my work when there is still so much more work to do. Um, and maybe it speaks to myself right now where I'm trying to come up with a list and just pull it on Shige's list and maybe I'm one of those people, um, you know, stepping into my own acknowledgement of that. So I just, it's something that's on my mind. Um, it's great that, that that piece or that that kind of milestone, if you want to call it that, has been hit, but it's, it's, a, it's a sign on a journey. It's not the end of the journey. Now, I remember uh, the LGBT Equity Center had brought was it the Equity Center or Studies? I can't exactly recall. Had brought um, a person who was working in, for a, a trans advocacy organization who essentially said something similar that around this 
there is no such thing as trickle down social justice. And it was such an impactful statement to me because it really did make me think about where do I really show up and where do I not? And where are we actually placing, where's the, the tip of the spear for these issues? So, and that was a while ago where we were having these type of conversations. So Shige, thank you. And, and, and Joey, thank you for that. Um, Luke, Ed, anything you wanna add? Sure. I mean, seeing Shige's left, of course, having retired just last May, I'm going, yeah, 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 on each of those. And there has indeed been a lot of conversations. If I had to explain restrooms one more time, I think I would have just, who knows, you know, I felt like I was being banging my head against the wall. And there's a couple of others too, that was like, really, do I have to explain that yet again? Uh, and I think the, the point I would make is that you know, if you're getting into this work or if you think of yourself as an advocate or as, as an activist, especially, um, you know, sometimes you do have to step back and take a break because you just need it for yourself. But you don't get you if you're getting into it to achieve a very specific goal and then I don't have to do it anymore. That's the wrong attitude. <laughs> It, it, it really needs to be something that you enjoy or, or at least are motivated to do the work and then actually um, find some degree of satisfaction at hitting at least some milestones along the way. Um, I do wanna say too, a couple of things that um, came up to me with both Madeline and uh, Mark's example is that on these one-on-one -on -one conversations and, and interactions, um, there's some ho internalized homophobia going on there. And that sort of brings to mind the internalized homophobia that a lot of students face in various ways. You know, we have students who come to campus who are out and proud and, you know, seemingly well-adjusted at least. Uh, and then we have students who come from backgrounds where their families are hostile. Um, and that's, that's not going to go away. And so really being able to, um, to reach individuals, having more Madelines around campus yeah. who, can, who can be visible and who students feel uh, drawn to. You know, I used to say when we did the old training things with our Rainbow Terrapin Network, uh, you know, a, a, a student of color might not feel comfortable coming and talking to me, and that's okay. But there needs to be a, another person that they do feel comfortable talking to. And then we need to be talking the, with each other so that we can figure out how we better meet people's needs. To quickly piggyback off that too, um, institutional advocate hat, there also needs to be that person, Luke, in my opinion, the institution needs to support that person. Because oftentimes that, that person, who isn't you or is Lou, the person of color who the students of color who are queer who are coming to, that's not their title, right? They're an academic advisor or they're working as a residence hall director or they're in the health center or they're in transportation services. And they're likely not gonna get paid for that additional work that they're doing. And those students who are going to them, they're gonna to talk to each other because that person is their resource. Um, and so how do we find a way to recognize the work that person's doing, the emotional labor, involved in it as well. Um, and also ideally the compensation too. Yeah, I, I think that's a longstanding issue that's become, that is talked about when you're talking about faculty of color, especially African-American faculty, but it's true in other areas as well. Compensating uh, uh, employees for work that they do that's a valuable contribution to campus and yet not might not be a part of their job description. Well, as a faculty member of color, I will say, and in fact, one of two faculty of color in my entire department, um, you know, I do a lot of that work and I'm happy to do it. And part of the reason why I'm in this business is because I want to do it, but it is, you know, it's one of those things where it's like when I am ready to go out for tenure or when I'm getting a review or whatever, it's really hard to document the fact that, oh, you know, in this week I had two students come talk to me about completely unrelated class things or whatever. And sometimes I can't talk about it because, you know, it's not anyone's business or, you know, whatever. Um, I do want to say, I mean, I don't know. I was thinking about a lot of stuff. Like I think, you know, about like how, what to do next or, or, or how can, you know, alum help or, you know, all that sort of stuff. I think, you know, I think stuff like this is really important. Um, I'm a really big person that's about like trying to think about 
ways to scale up everyday acts, right? So like sometimes you can't, you don't have the capacity or the bandwidth to tackle the giant issue X, Y, or Z, but there might be ways to break that down into everyday acts that, that allow you to at least sort of, you know, create additional community points or a coalition or whatever. Um, and to also think about the sort of the pass, you know, back to the kind of the passing of the baton uh, from one generation to another, or one cohort to another, so that there is some uh, continuity. And then the big thing of like, you know, how do you deal with passion fatigue? Because that was something that is, is something, you know, like you can go, 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 go so hard. And then suddenly you have to stop because you just don't have any, you know, gas left, which I've encountered many times in, in my life. And so I think those are other things that we can kind of, of think about, even as we are doing the really important work of making sure that, you know, the institution changes and that we really honor things like all these buzzwords, diversity, inclusion, equity, like all that sort of stuff. I think there are also other sort of, unfortunately, you know, other ways that we can do stuff that isn't necessarily just about those sort of official channels, I guess. I'd like to sort of turn our conversation to the current moment, particularly around COVID-19. I'm wondering if you could reflect a little bit about how COVID-19 has affected LGBTQ plus community generally, perhaps around where you are, um, and maybe some insights into how it might be affecting the very students, certainly the incoming students, uh, or perhaps graduate students or faculty and staff who are experiencing a very different life and a very different community than the ones we've sort of been reminiscing about. I'm wondering if you have thoughts about sort of the current state of community based on the pandemic. Okay, this is the one question where I will voluntarily hop on first. Um, obviously, I've said it before, I'm at this intersection of being a queer professional and working in a healthcare facility and I won't speak to all the things because I think they will be said by other folks in this panel. Um, I think all of us probably have some ideas mulling in our minds about our own experience and the experience of students who we may have encountered. But one of the things that I have been the most worried about and continue to be concerned about is students who ended up at home, right? Or in an environment where they were not in a university setting for necessity, right? We all did what we had to do. Um, but not only was there not that ability to build that community in the same ways or do that identity de development in the same ways that you do when you're in person and on a residential campus, but I also worry deeply about students' mental health and well being, um, for, particularly for students who um, were not out to their families or who were um, and experienced backlash. I also think about our students who we have an incredible team of providers at the health center who help students initiate hormone therapy. Um, and I think about you know the students who were not able to continue uh, their, their hormone therapy work at the health center with us, not only the mental health detriments, but also the physical health det detriments. And, potential for, you know, some really harmful living environments and how that impacts students long term and this really critical part of sort of their, their development journeys. I mean, when we think about when the brain fully develops, it's when you're 25. So this is your, your undergraduate years are kind of those and a little bit into your graduate years are really those last few years of kind of cementing in um, sort of who you are and how you see the world. And there's slight variation after that, but um, this generation of students is going to be shaken up in a very real way. And I, it's one of the things that, Ed, you were speaking earlier to, you know, like taking those meetings with students for like two hours a day who just need to like just need to talk something out that is not at all related to your class or your program or what have you. And can I document it on my annual report? No. Do what I want to? Probably not. But is it critical? And would I absolutely spend part of my day doing that and work later into the evening to get my other stuff done? Yeah. 
because it is so critical, particularly at this moment, not only to be deeply felt as part of the University of Maryland community, but to be deeply felt and understood and feel cared for by the queer community at University of Maryland right now as a student. Um, one of the things I care about deeply as Lambda Pride president is recruiting young alums um, to keep that connection to community going. So that's the thing that like kept me up at night, you know, in addition to, you know, the other horrific COVID-19 and other sort of world doomsday stuff that was happening over 2020 and in into the present moment. But I kept thinking about those students who were stuck in these like kind of horrific living environments where they were not able to do and be all the things they wanted to do and be as a University of Maryland student. And it, it breaks my heart and it makes me feel really fired up to like make up for lost time almost and make them feel like so affirmed. Other thoughts from our panel? I, I, I'm debating, I, or I have been debating, obviously since I've logged on, I'm gonna say it now. But uh, whether to bring it up, uh, for those of you who don't know, we had two student suicides last year. And that's not the first time that that's happened. We've had suicides both of, of, of faculty and students and others uh, over the years. But it just really brought home. And, and in neither of these instances were they actually living at home full time. They were in the College Park area. But there wasn't the kind of other connections that you know were going on, and and uh, certainly it if it, it, it continues to affect me because I can't help but think, what did I not do that I could have done? And um, I don't know the answer to that, and maybe there isn't an answer, a good answer for that. But um, but it does haunt me, and I do think that. Um, making sure that our, I mean, you can't be in this business if you don't care about students, right? Um, but being able to, to make all of the students who you can feel supported and welcome, and yes, you can talk to me about anything, and, um, and connecting with each other, because I found that some of the best support, that, well, some of the immediate support that students seek out is other students. So making sure that these other students who are being approached for having for being supportive are have the capability, have the tools to be helpful to to be supportive in in ways that are very appropriate. So I, I, I think we're hopefully coming out of who knows, um, certainly one of the most trying episodes of my career. Can we add any thoughts that you'd like to add? Um, I, well, one, I want to really appreciate the sharing that as well. And it's something that you thought about sharing and not sharing, and that is devastating to hear. And I'm, I'm so sorry for the loss um, for the community. And it's terrible to hear that. Um, and the direction I was going was, was not personal. So I don't mean to have a poor transition from that. I think, you know, LGBT community is not monolithic, in my opinion, but it's also not the first time that it's a community that's faced a plague. Right. And so I think I'm very privileged as someone who, you know, grew up in the 80s um, that I learned a lot about HIV AIDS um, through my teen years. Now, also a lot of that was misinformation based on what we now know today um, and what we knew at the time um, as well. But I also think I'm of a generation that lost a lot of potential mentors because of HIV AIDS because of the lack of response to it, the actual response to it, and how society at large in this country and in the world was responsive to folks who are or were HIV positive. Um, so while COVID-19 is not the same, I also think too, what are the lessons we can learn from this, right? What, what are the current students, whether they're traditionally aged students um, who can walk away from this? And it's not obviously a plague, that just like HIV is not something just affecting the LGBT community, um, but what are the lessons that we can 
learn from this and take it seriously, knowing that it is very real. Um, and it's something that we need to carry forward and you know make important choices based on it. So I don't know what those lessons are yet because we're still not out of this thing, um, even though it seems to be getting better. Um, but you know we've, we've said this before in the last year and a half. So I don't, I don't know what the, the lessons are learned yet, but my, I'd like to be hopeful um, that we can at least be better this time around dealing with multiple plagues that are still real. I don't have much to add. I think most people, you know, I'm, you know, I think everyone is still sort of processing what this past year has meant and what the pandemic continues to, to re, you know, what continues to happen and, you know, all that sort of stuff. So, um, um, I don't have a good answer right now. I will say, I mean, I guess I will just sort of disclose, like, um, I actually got a uh, COVID two weeks ago, uh, as a breakout case, a breakthrough case. And, um, it, it really has changed my attitude about like what I'm even doing in a lot of ways. Um, I realize, you know, it, this seems like a weird thing to say, but I'm like, I'm really not willing to die for my institution. Um, especially if it's an institution that isn't necessarily caring for myself or for people that, you know, I think are important. Um, and so, you know, that's the, 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 that's an assessment that I'm sort of like going through myself and that's just directly impacting me. And I can't imagine, well, I can't imagine that's the problem point, right? Like, you know, what our communities that are going through, especially when it comes to things like um, housing or safety or health uh, risks or all that sort of stuff. But yeah, I think, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna see a lot, probably a lot more, you know, gloom, but hopefully we will also find ways and to survive and to push on and to, to grow. And I think that's really important also. I'd actually like to take the spirit of your uh, comment there, Ed, and I, I wanna pose sort of a, a last question for our panel. Um, that is, you know, for you, how, what does community mean to you? And specifically, can you connect what that meaning of community means to you and how community plays a role in LGBTQ plus advocacy? So what is it to you and how do you see community really supporting advocacy? This is, I mean, I don't know if this, this sounds weird, but I'm trying to formulate this in my head. Um, you know, and I think, you know, I, I'm obviously, I'm not at, in Maryland or there. And I think one of the things that made Maryland so special was because um, it was, it was, you know, near Washington, D.C. And there was a lot of stuff that happened that was good there and, and allowed for a lot of exploration and all that good stuff. But also it was in a large enough place that, you know, you could, there were enough people to sort of have a, 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 a mass of, you know, uh, of people to do stuff with and things like that. And I think, I think community right now for me, especially because, you know, I'm in a rural place, I'm in a town of 14,000, you know, I moved here to start work here and I have some colleagues that are friends, but for the most part, I'm here by myself. Um, uh, you know, I, I, uh, was in a long distance relationship for a really long time because, you know, my partner lived in Seattle and then, you know, didn't want to move to rural Ohio. Imagine that. Um, uh, and then, uh, and then a little over two years ago, he passed away. And so like, that's been also things that have been sort of informing what I want to do and where I want to stay. And I think community for me right now is like, one of the great things about Maryland was that in a sense, there was always someone there, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you, and some of that is like people you did know and wanted to hang out with and do stuff with, but also sometimes you're just like, I wanna go someplace where I know I'm gonna be okay or welcome or, or find a new friend or whatever. And I think that's, I think for a lot of my students here, because it, the, the community is so small, it can be really hard you know, especially for example, you know, as dramatic as queer communities can be, like if you have a falling out with a group, that sometimes is the only group, right? Um, and then what do you do? And so I think that tension is there. So community right now is like, it's always 
something that I helped to start and create. And I think that you need to, if you don't have a community or you feel disconnected, you need to find people who are those kinds of catalyzers. But then also at the same time, um, I think you, you, you know, the best thing you can do is just show up and then community will come out of that, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. And you hit my, my, ironically, I got some help from this because my therapist asked me this question last week. So I did some pre-work on this, but community is the people who show up, um, plain and simple in, in my view. And I think that is a through line of what activism is to me, what advocacy is to me, what community friendships, relationships, colleagueships, being an instructor or, you know, a an adult, an adult presence in students' lives. It's the people who show up for you. And that doesn't mean that we have to have the same experiences because like you said, Joy, we're not a monolith. And that's one of, I mean, that's true of all communities, but I think it's one that's particularly special about the queer communities. There is such a breadth of experiences within our own community and the through line being, or I would hope being, we all give a shit about each other. Um, that's that's my goal, right? So that that is community to me. That is the promise of being a queer person at the University of Maryland. And it's one I hope to continue to fulfill in all the roles I play here. And it's one that I feel really grateful to be a part of, even a really small part of it. I think you're doing that, Madeline. I mean, having sat in the Land of Pride President's chair, I appreciate you in many ways before. And it's like, I think we all, all of us on this, you know, we've benefited from folks known and unknown um, who've done work um, in LGBTQ spaces um, and for the university at different times in different places. And I, I agree with both of you. I think it is showing up, right? When, you know, being asked and, and also I think when you're being asked to show up to also be like, who, who isn't showing up, right? Luke, I go back to your conversation in the late nineties too, right? And it's like, you know, who I'm being asked to show up, awesome. Who else is gonna be there? Cause sometimes who's not gonna be there, right? And is that a gap? And how do we how do we make some intentional efforts to fill that gap? So I agree with that. And the other thing I would, I would add to community as well is I think for myself, um, how I conceptualize community has changed. Like, and I keep going back to the paper behind your head, my friends, because I think, Community to me is the paper and the people in the safe space room in the late 90s and the early 2000s. And I'm now thinking about traditional age students at home in their residence hall on campus, wherever campus is for them, forming communities and online spaces via mechanisms like the one that we're using right now, which to me does not come as naturally because I'm not a digital native, right? It didn't come up with it, come up in the same environment as traditional age students did as well. So I think it's just something to keep in mind as we, as we pass the torps as well and try to create space and reach out to folks is how do we uh, how do we merge communities or how do we how's our understanding of community continue to evolve knowing that the very concept right now while very natural to probably a, a 20 year old on campus or a 25 year old on campus whatever is very different to someone who's a 45 year old on campus just based on the mechanism and the technologies that we're accustomed to using or not using let me, Thanks for your comment. Uh, that's a very great observation. Yeah. Luke, no, any was, thoughts? Yeah, I was going to say that um, community is caring uh, on some level. And I, I think it's also important now that community and community building is work. And some of us put a lot of effort into it, and some of us don't put as much effort into it. But, it, but if you just show up, that's putting some effort into it. But it's also thinking, thinking about all the things that can happen in life, because what I've learned, you know, for those of you who don't know, my first partner died of AIDS in 1990, so I've lived through that. You really need community in certain moments of life. And if you don't have it, you can't build it right then. So it takes some work and, and people should give some forethought about community and about uh, creating families of choice and which is a different level of community uh in in a way but those those um 
anybody that was is willing to hear, I want to tell them community is important. You need to put some effort into it, even if it's not a whole lot of effort. But um, but yeah, community is caring, and it takes some work. So let me also just add my own little thought about that as we close. Um, I think community also is about the impacts we have on people that we may not realize. So uh, there's this saying, I don't know who said it, but you know, that a lighthouse doesn't run around trying to find ships to warn or, or save, right? A lighthouse simply stands still and is visible um, and, and, and does what it does by being still and really clear about its purpose. And um, I want to honor the name of someone that had that impact on me many years ago um, at a time when I think it was far more difficult to be out. Uh, she had passed uh, during my time at the University of Maryland. She was a, a, an African-American woman faculty member by the name of Rhonda Williams, who I was unprepared for the impact her passing had on me personally. Um, I couldn't understand what was happening to me. She and I were friendly um, and we would have conversations and when we'd see each other in, in various settings, it was great. But I was unprepared for her passing, for the impact that it would have felt devastating to me. Um, and I realized it was because that shoreline no longer had that lighthouse. Uh, she really was that example, that visibility, uh, that signaled community is here, and I'm an example of it. And so, um, you know, I want to at least take the time today to honor her memory as well. Rhonda Williams was a true pioneer in every sense of the word for LGBTQ plus community at the University of Maryland, and I'm grateful for it. So. To that end, I want to thank everyone for being a, a, a part of tonight's panel. Thank you, Luke, Madeline, Joey, and Ed for your time. We're grateful for it. And for all of the participation that we've had here in the chat um, and the engagement with, with our panel. Um, I'd like to invite Madeline, if you would, to perhaps say a little more about uh, the Alumni Association group and how people can be involved and what might be coming next. Yeah. So first of all, hats off to you, Mark. Um, for those who don't know, Mark had to step into this pretty last minute to serve as a moderator and did a pretty impeccable job. So I'm deeply grateful for, for your pinch hitting and also just for your continued colleagueship and friendship. And kind of piggybacking off of that lighthouse motif that you so beautifully spoke to, that's kind of my my goal and our goal with Lambda Pride is to be this lighthouse that students can prepare down the pike. Like your community here does not have to end the moment you cross the graduation stage. In fact, it gets to continue on in this group, Lambda Pride, where we come together multiple times a year to do sometimes more formalized events like this, like a panel. Sometimes they'll be virtual, sometimes they'll be in person, sometimes it'll just be hanging out at a restaurant and you know chatting and getting to know each each other a little better. Um, and there is always, always an opportunity to be involved in Lambda Pride. If you have any interest at all in being involved, all you have to do, and I'm going to pop my email address in the chat here right now, just email me and let me know that you're interested in being involved. We don't have like a regular schedule of meetings. We kind of figure out when the next meeting is going to be at the last meeting. Um, and we are going to enter a little bit of a hibernation period over the winter. But our goal is to have an in-person event in the spring in the DC area, more of a social event, uh, get to know each other, get to hang out, um, get to build that community. Um, and we hope that, um, really hope to see some of you in the DC area there. We will, my hope is also to continue to do virtual programs so we can have folks like Ed in Ohio come join us, right? That's part of this evolving definition of community too. The lighthouse is now digital. Um, <laughs> perfect. Mark it for the spring. Don't know when, but we'll see you there. Um, but yeah, if you want to be involved or you just want to be looped in 
to know whenever our spring events are happening, you can email me at mmore2015 at gmail.com. And I am more than happy to get you connected in whatever ways make sense for you, whether that's being a board member or just staying in the loop. Um, but all of you are, oh, Joey said, we have a guest room for those needing a place in DC. You just have to like or tolerate cats. <laughs> um, cats are queer culture. But anyway, um, I want to thank every single person here for being here. I'm so grateful to all of you for being present. And I hope that this is the start of a larger Lambda Pride presence and hope to see y'all soon. Thank you for coming, everybody. Thank you for being a part of this. And uh, we wish our panel well. We wish all of our guests well. Enjoy uh, the fall season. All right, everybody, we'll see you on the other side of winter. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.